So I'm going to talk about the emerging concept um, of cosmopolitan localism, which is a very important strand in the new field of design, uh, transition design, um, that a small, uh, well, a group of us at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University and several other universities around the world have been uh, developing uh, for the last uh, few years. So transition design seeks to use design tools, uh, processes and methods to achieve large scale systems level uh, change. It asks how design can help transition entire societies towards more sustainable, convivial, convivial, equitable, participatory and emancipatory futures. We use the term design and designers in the broadest sense to describe not simply professional design and designers, but the quest in Herbert Simon's words to change existing conditions into preferred ones. So transition design grows out of a trend in design to address ever broader systems issues, problems of increasing complexity that require the engagement of multiple specialisms, not just designers, multiple stakeholders from different social sectors and grassroots communities. I'm going to move the slide now. Uh, you should have a new slide on wicked problems. So transition design sets out to address a class of problems often referred to as wicked problems. And it argues that most of the large complex problems we collectively face have this character. So you can see on the slide some of the key features of uh, wicked problems. Um, they're multi-causal, multi-scalar, interconnected. They straddle disciplinary and organizational boundaries. They're connected to each other. Um, the uh, solutions to wicked problems ramify throughout the whole system. So there's no simple solutions. There's no right or wrong solutions. Um, and, and so on and so on. So I just uh, wanted to give you a sense of the, the broad characters of wicked problems. And one of the things we do in our uh, transition design seminar for masters and doctoral students um, at Carnegie Mellon um, is we assign the students um, wicked problems uh, um, that can be found in Pittsburgh and um, we ask them to uh, research them and, and uh, speculate on possible interventions that might be uh, that might address these problems over um, long horizon or short, medium, and long horizons of time. And so here, here you can see the kinds of problems that they're looking at: uh, racial discrimination, poor air quality, obesity, homelessness, opioid addiction, lack of affordable housing, um, lack of access to healthy food, and so on. And it becomes obvious to students as their research proceeds that all of these problems are inextricably interrelated. And so we ask them to begin to explore ecologies of potential solutions that solve for multiple problems simultaneously, synergistic solutions. And such solutions will exist at multiple levels of scale and be implemented, as I said, over multiple horizons of time in multiple domains. They can be infrastructure solutions, policy solutions, uh, solutions to do with how we, the economy, works, technologies, a collective narratives, practices, norms, and worldviews. Moving on. So this is the transition design framework, which we use as a way of organizing how we think about transition design and how we navigate the very wide range of scholarship and research from outside of design that we draw on. And there are four interrelating and mutually constituting areas that we focus on. Posture and mindset, theories of change, visions, and new ways of designing. So in a few weeks in this series, Terry Irwin, uh, who is also at Carnegie Mellon, is going to be giving a broader overview of transition design. Here I want to focus my attention, uh, here I want to focus my attention on one particular area of interest, what has been called cosmopolitan localism, which sits at the top in the visions section of the framework. Cosmopolitan localism 
represents the vision of future societies towards which transition design aspires. My way of thinking about cosmopolitan localism has been heavily influenced both by living systems theory, which underlies, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, which underlies all of the areas of the framework, but also by the social ecology of eco-philosopher Murray Bookchin and the tradition to which he belongs. And I'll discuss this more in a minute. So most grassroots, grassroots green activism tends to focus on localism as central to its vision of the future. The argument being that by producing for themselves as many goods and services as is reasonably possible, communities can develop a better quality of life, reinvigorate local cultures, minimize their environmental impact. In short, relocalization is what will allow communities to thrive. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not possible to address the kinds of problems that, need to, that we need to address through localism alone. Localities need to share resources and skills through confederated structures and through networked uh, structures. And localization is a strategy that's likely to lead us down a very parochial and isolationist road. So wicked problems are never confined to isolated local areas. They rapidly, problems rapidly become planetary and planetary problems rapidly become localized. Um, certain aspects of new alternative lifestyles that need to be designed at levels of scale are larger or greater than the local. Uh, many local initiatives will benefit from knowledge, technology and skills shared with other communities engaged with sim in similar activities. While each locality should have some degree of self-reliance, localities need each other. They cannot transition in isolation. So transitioning therefore requires the development of various kinds of networked exchange, cross-fertilization and institutionalized networking. And this is where cosmopolitanism comes in. So traditionally, cosmopolitanism has focused on humanity's oneness on the equal dignity of human beings regardless of where they live and extrapolating from this on universal human rights for all citizens of the world. But in recent decades, philosophies of cosmopolitanism in response to globalization, westernization and colonialism of various kinds has been increasingly defined as a concern for the ethical, political and cultural and societal uh, implications of the encounter between different peoples and cultures on equal terms and it asks how new ways of being in the world might emerge out of such uh, encounters. So Gerard Delanti says that the cosmopolitan imagination incurs, occurs whenever new relations between self, other and world develop in moments of openness, a reframing of identities or loyalties and self-understanding in ways that have no clear direction. So the question is, how do we uh, uh, integrate cosmopolitan and localism? And how, how do we, if you like, get the best of both perspectives? So localism focuses on the satisfaction of needs and self-reliance. How can localities develop more integrated and self-contained economies and, how can, and more participatory political systems uh, through which they can satisfy material and non-material needs? How do the, cre the creation of community, how do we recover or ge regenerate the social fabric in our villages, neighborhoods, towns and cities? And localism focuses on living in place and bioregion. How, how do we do, uh, how do we attend to the first two points in ways that are specific and appropriate to particular ecosystems, particular histories and particular traditions? So by contrast, um, cosmopolitan focuses on otherness and diversity. How can the otherness of diverse cultures be respected and, celebrate and celebrated? And specifically, um, how can Western and non-Western countries escape from the monoculture of globalization? Um, our common humanity, given the diversity of cultures, tradition and histories, how can we establish a common human identity and aspirations? Can there be universal human rights? Sharing of knowledge and skills and resources. 
cosmopolitan asks, how can localities, towns, cities, regions help one another in practical ways to address complex, wicked problems? Uh, the co-evolution of cultures and communities. How do cultures creatively encounter one another, to use Delante's expression? And, and finally, cohabitation and collective responsibility for the planet. How do we take collective responsibility for the well-being of the non-human and the ecological uh, integrity of the planet as a whole? So cosmopolitan localism hopes to integrate the polar opposites of cosmopolitanism and localism and to address the questions posed both by both. Questions which on the one hand embrace the whole planet and the whole of humanity, and on the other focus on specific and relatively bounded communities, cultures and ecosystems. The term cosmopolitan localism was coined by the eco-sociologist Wolfgang Sachs. He defined it as a system through which the biophysical integrity of the planet as a whole is a mutual responsibility of localized communities rather than technocratic regimes and international agencies. And he argued that it's necessary to allow each culture to actualize its particular image of the good society. And this actualization of each, of each should unfold in ways that do not undermine other localized good societies or the possibility of planetary cohabitation. So as I said my, earlier, my way of thinking about cosmopolitan localism uh, can be traced back to the social ecologist Murray Bookchin, who can be seen with me uh, a few years ago in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. But even more broadly, my thinking uh, can be um, located in the tra tradition of what I've called radical holism. The radical holists were various stripes of non authoritarian thinkers who, in different ways, all looked to the natural world, to ecology, to living systems theory to scaffold their society critique, the societal critique, and their non-hierarchical and emancipatory social and political outlook. They all believed in the capacity of human beings to cooperatively organize or self-organize their own lives from within their own communities, and all believed that top-down and centralized institutions generally impeded rather than aided this process. So I think that cosmopolitan localism is the heir to this organicist tradition, and therefore this tradition uh, can be used to inform and develop cosmopolitan localism. So the choice of metaphor used here, uh, that is the metaphor of the organic as a way to conceptualize society, made by the radical holists and others is hugely significant. Um, the cognitive psychologist uh, George Lakoff argues that our ordinary conceptual system, in terms of which we both think and act, is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. And he went on, metaphor is a major and indispensable part of our ordinary conventional way of conceptualizing the world. Our everyday behavior reflects our metaphorical understanding of experience. It's a system of metaphor that structures our everyday conceptual system and so on. As soon as one gets away from concrete physical experience and starts talking about abstractions or emotions, metaphorical understanding is the norm. Now here is a definition of um, a metaphor. And it says uh, in particular, particularly interesting, it says a carrying over, metaphor is a carrying over, transfer. Um, so in a sense, you could say that um, uh, the radical holists were carrying over or transferring the concept of the organic into how they thought about societal organization. So Werner Stark, uh, an obscure German sociologist from the mid 20th century, argued that um, the organic and the mechanistic have been competing metaphors through which Western thought, at least, has oriented itself for millennia. And that dichotomy has profoundly affected our social, political, anthropological, economic ideologies and structures. The using the metaphor of the organic in the social realm means looking at society as if it were or could be in organisms, as organisms are self-organizing beings in relationship with one another, collectively creating entire ecosystems. So humans are seen as self-organizing beings in relationship with one another and through such mutually reciprocating and distributed self-organization they can create decentralized communities and societies. 
On the other hand, if society is a machine, then communities must be pieced together out of isolated and competing individuals. They must then be externally managed and controlled through hierarchical centralized bureaucratic institutions. So to take an example of a radical holist who was very sophisticated in his use of this metaphor, Lewis Mumford argued that at certain moments in history and particular in the era of industrial capitalism, mechanistic ways of thinking and structuring society have been elevated to the detriment of both the natural world and what he called organic communities and social structures. What he calls the mega machine established predictable behavior and remote control from the center by transferring autonomy from each individual member and group in the community to the organized whole in which they would function only as obedient machine line like parts. And he argued that with the industrial revolution, purely mechanical forms were superimposed upon every manifestation of life. Another in the tradition, Martin Buber, argued that the organic fabric, the cell tissue of society, was being hollowed out by capitalism. Whatever point we examine the structure, structurally rich society, we find the cell tissue society, a living and life-giving consociation of human beings shaping and reshaping within. Society is not naturally composed, naturally composed not of individuals, but of associative units and the associations between them. Uh, and he goes on, under capitalist economy and the state peculiar to it, the constitution of society was continually being hollowed out. Uh, remember the term hollowed out, we'll come back to that. So that the modern individualizing process finished up as a process of atomization. Uh, Murray Bookchin's historical narrative, to take another example, was based on the argument that hierarchies of all kinds have destroyed organic communities and organic social forms. And he argued that we miss, must cover a new form of organic society, a society based on ecological principles, a new organic society on a new level of historical and technological development, an organic society in which the splits within society, he says, between society and nature and within the human psyche, created by thousands of years of hierarchical development, can be healed and transcended. And then he continues, um, either we will create ecotopia based on ecological principles, or we will simply go under as a species. Um, sorry about that. So cosmopolitan localism, um, in my view, represents the re-emergence of a social, political, and technological paradigm that is once organicist or holistic and emancipatory. It can be thought of as the social and political economic institutionalization of the principles of chaos and complexity theory, which demonstrate in contemporary scientific terms that organic systems are self-organizing, emergent and participatory. And that's exactly the language of social ecology used to, uh, that social ecology uses to uh, critique society with. Uh, Meg Wheatley says, um, order emerges as elements of the system work together, discovering each other and together inventing new capacities. And complexity and chaos theory also show how natural systems are not only self-organizing, they are multi-scalar networked webs of relationship. So thinking uh, metaphorically, the organization of natural systems are analogous to the organization of different levels of scale of everyday life in what Buber, Mumford, Bookchin, Jacobs, and so on, would have broadly described as organic society. This nested organic pattern represents the basic and more or less universal structure of everyday life in traditional societies. And you'll notice that the nature of the relationships and therefore the nature of everyday life shifts from level to level in the move from household through to village, city, and region. Relationships become looser and more transient but more diverse and multiple. This gave everyday life at each level of scale in traditional societies its particular flavor. Um, everyday life at the level of the village was very different from everyday life at the level of the city. Each level of scale represented a different kind of community. And these complex networks of everyday life that come into being at each level of scale are formed as people go about their everyday lives, satisfying their material and non-material needs. So um, to use the um, taxonomy of the economist Manfred Max Neef, 
um, their needs for subsistence, participation, belonging, security, creation, affection. By the way, I, I strongly recommend that you um, uh, track down Manfred Max Neef. Um, I, I haven't mentioned him before, but he's extremely important, relevant uh, uh, thinker to anyone interested in the question of transition. Um, the fabric of everyday life is woven together as people uh, strive to satisfy their needs. Needs were met in different ways at each level of scale, and each level had its own unique contribution to make to the quality of everyday life. So people go about satisfying their material and non-material needs, and com as they do so, complex webs of relationships are established between what might be called the parts of everyday life, and you can see them on this slide. People, people and their artefacts, um, and people and nature. And everyday life could be defined as the webs of relationship that are established between people, nature and artefacts as they go about satisfying their material and non-material needs. So, um, unfortunately, this, uh, this pattern has broken down in modern society, where the satisfiers for need after need, for subsistence, participation, belonging, security, uh, these are all Max Neef's, all the needs that Max Neef identifies, even affection. They're appropriate, the satisfiers for those needs, the way in which people um, address them and come to meet them, are managed and controlled by centralised and centralising institutions and organisations which aren't embedded in the, in the everyday life of communities. And the result is that the basic structure of everyday life is transformed and its webs of relationships compromised. Since the ecosystem or fabric of everyday life emerges as people satisfy their needs, the domains of everyday life, the household, the city, the region, the neighborhood, um, as, or, as organic and therefore integrated and mutualistic and self-organizing and semi-autonomous forms are hollowed out and begin to fragment. Um, so, as I've said, uh, said before, Bookchin, Boomer and others frequently use the expression hollowed out to describe the condition of the social fabric in capitalist society. And if we can apply a contemporary iteration of the organic metaphor to their argument, this is what the hollowing out of society looks like. So, to summarise, the domains of everyday life arise as integrated, self-organising organic forms as communities satisfy their needs. And as they lose control of that process, as society is centralised, everyday life is emptied of its function, structure and vitality and cohesiveness, leading to the hollowing out and the fragmentation and the homogenization of households, neighbourhoods, cities, regions and so on. And that in turn leads to multiple ecological, social, economic and political issues from which everyday life is suffering all over the world. Wicked problems. So it's addressing these wicked problems from biodiversity loss to poverty and inequity, from institutionalized racism and air pollution, from lack of uh, access to healthy food to deforestation. Those are the central focus of transition design. So in short, there's a direct correlation between the loss of organic social stru structure of everyday life, the centralization of social and political and economic power and the proliferation of wicked problems. The transition design um, argues that we need to help communities reappropriate satisfiers for their needs um, through multiple ecologies of interventions at all levels of scale of everyday life over short, medium and long horizons of time to help networks of households, neighbourhoods, cities and regions become dynamic, mutualistic, self-organising, semi-autonomous forms, organic forms that strike a balance between autonomy and interdependence. This is a kind of uh, bird's eye view of a cosmopolitan localist society, an organic society in which everyday life has been reconstituted at different levels of scale through the recovery of communities' abilities to satisfy their needs at each of these. Everyday life is nested and networked and self-organized through mutualistic relationships between people, nature, their artifacts, established from within the permeable boundaries of the domains of everyday life. Interdependencies exist between the domains at the same level of scale 
and between domains at different levels of scale. So, for example, households cooperate with other households in their daily tasks. Neighbourhoods engage with other neighbourhoods and the city at large. Cities network and confederate with one another and so on, forming dense, holarchic and diverse webs of interdependence. That densely woven fabric of everyday life arises because communities have been empowered to control the satisfaction of their needs. So communities have been relocalized, but at multiple interconnecting levels of scale from the household to the planet. Um, and there is a quick uh, sideways view of cosmopolitan localism as multi-directional and multi-scalar symbiotic networking of everyday life a decentralized and self-organized system in which social and political power is distributed throughout rather than concentrated in particular places. So if we come back to the slide which lists the characteristics of localism and cosmopolitanism, we can see how this organicist vision grounded in the radical holist tradition can address each of these points. As far as localization is concerned, um, uh, this can provide a framework within which needs can be satisfied um, at multiple levels of scale of everyday life from household and neighborhood to city and region and planet. That's localization point one. It provides a framework within which different kinds of community can emerge at each of these levels of scale. That's localization point two. It provides a framework within which satisfaction, need satisfaction can be distributed and decentralized and therefore tailored to specific places and bioregions. That's localization point three. As far as cosmopolitanism is concerned, this organicist approach provides a framework which allows communities to satisfy their needs in place-based ways and therefore overcome the homogenizing drive of, of globalization. That's cosmopolitanism point one. It provides a framework within which our common humanity can be acknowledged. Humans everywhere have similar sets of needs, if we uh, follow Manfred Max Neef's analysis, that must be satisfied in our everyday lives. Even if this is done in very different ways from one place and, uh, and cult one culture to another, that's cosmopolitanism point two. It provides a framework within which knowledge, skills uh, and resources can be shared at multiple levels of scale that's cosmopolitanism point three, and it therefore allows cultures and communities to co-evolve, that's cosmopolitanism point four, and to take collective responsibility for the planet, that's cosmopolitanism point five. So to summarize, cosmopolitan localism um, is an alternative, represents an alternative to globalization based on the metaphor of society as an organism. It's the theory of interregional and planet-wide cooperative networking between decentralized, place-based, self-organizing and participatory communities that are in control of the satisfaction of their needs at all levels of scale of everyday life, household, neighborhood, city, region and planet, and that share responsibility for collective societal well-being and the biophysical integrity of the planet. So there's a few questions just to finish off with um, that are need to be addressed by uh, proponents of cosmopolitan localism, uh, what responsibilities do cities and communities have for each other, new kinds of political and economic institutions will be required, how can we address inequities between cities and communities, and how can we uh, address potentially competitive relationships, how can they be made symbiotic relationships, what happens when a city or community uses more than its fair share of resources, damages the environment or is aggressive towards another city? What are the barriers to cosmopolitan localism, social, economic, political, technological and psychological? Um, and how do our visions become more cosmopolitan and less confined to the scale of the neighbourhood and the city?